Hello everyone, hope you're still with me. If you're still tracking along with this Bible reading plan, why don't you just like this video or give me a wave in the comments, come say hello. I've been loving going through this Bible study with you guys and I've been reading every comment and learning so much from everybody else's perspective too on the profound truth of so many of these scriptures. So if you've been following along and you haven't said hello yet or you haven't shared anything yet, I wanna challenge you to jump in the comments today and share something that stood out from this book of Philippians for you, because this is our joy book. This book is such a treat. And hopefully it's not only going to be informative to you to read through this together, but it's actually gonna give you disperse some joy as well, because that is kind of one of the themes of this book. It's an incredibly uh, encouraging, gratitude filled book. And we see how obedience brings joy. That's really what this book is all about. So if you haven't said hello yet, jump on. If you're still tracking with me, give me a wave, say hello. If you're going real time at the beginning of January or if you're catching up or if you're finding this at another point, then just jump on and say hello because I love to know who's watching along and reading with us. Um, it's such a blessing to me. So it's context day. We're starting a new book. So let me share some brief context about this particular letter. Paul's letter to the church in Philippi and just let you know a little bit of the history. Now, this is a city that is not particularly Christianized. Um, the city itself, there are a lot of people who worship the emperor, um, a lot of people who worshiped Egyptian gods, um, multiple deities, multiple different forms of worship going on in lots of different places. And the way that we end up here in Philippi is found in Acts 16. So if you want to read any context for this book, then head to Acts 16 because you'll find that Paul was on one of his missionary journeys and he had a vision in a dream of a man calling out to him and saying, come to Macedonia. There are saints in Macedonia who need you. And that's where we find ourselves at the beginning of this book. Um, Paul acts on that dream and it becomes known as the Macedonian call. If you've ever heard that referred to, it's the, the cry of the people to call out for help and for support, for teaching. And he goes on straight away to find himself in Philippi in Macedonia, which is in Greece. And he there establishes the first Christian church in Europe. Now, this letter is written 11 years later after he's done work there and after he's poured into the people there, he's been discipling people there for roughly 11 years. But on his very first trip there, he feels led by the Holy Spirit through this dream to go and start evangelizing to the people. And on the sun, and as the Sabbath day comes around, he uh, goes looking for a temple for a place of worship. Now, generally, the Jewish law of the day was that you had to have 10 men in order to set up a temple. And we're told that Paul and his traveling companions ended up by the river, which would imply that there wasn't even a temple of 10 believers in that city because there was no temple existing or certainly not one that he could find. So he ended up by the river because that's where lots of believers tended to gather in order to encourage one another, pray for one another, which I think is really beautiful. And there at the river, he meets a woman called Lydia. Now, what do we know about Lydia? We know that she was dressed in purple linen and she was a trader of purple linen and purple dye was one of the most expensive dyes that you could find at the time. So we're given these clues about this affluent of this woman uh, and she was raised as a Gentile but she came to know the God of the Jews and she believed in him and she started to hear Paul speak and she was moved by the power of Jesus that he was talking about he introduced her to the Holy Spirit and she decided that she wanted him to baptize her so it actually says her whole household were baptized but it also says that she persuaded Paul and his traveling companions to come and stay with her and again, the implication that we can read here is that she was wealthy. You know, you don't invite a group of traveling men to, you know, come and stay in your hut. She had a home, she had a house, a proper house. Um, she was an affluent member of society. And it's on the back of her obedience that the Philippi church, this Philippian church was really able to begin to grow because people were willing to open up their homes. And I'm reminded in a very strange season of all of our lives where for some of us, we are able to meet in small groups. For some, we're not able at all. God is visiting us in our homes. And I think over the months and years to come, we'll have the opportunity to welcome people into our homes and share his love 
in a more profound way than we have for some time. So I just love the fact that that's how this book starts. It starts with house church. It starts with one woman's obedience. And it also has these really affluent undertones. There's a an incredibly rich generosity in the church of the Philippians. And even uh, if we start reading this, so as I said, this letter is written 11 years after those establishing steps where Paul is writing to the believers in this church. And one of the things he says in verse three, I thank God in all my remembrance, always in prayer, you are for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. There are many ways that we can partner with the gospel, but one of the most profound ways and one of the ways that Paul is so joy filled because of in this letter is giving. They were such a giving church, not always out of plenty, sometimes out of lack, but they were faithful in their generosity. And as I say, a theme of obedience runs through this book, the joy that comes from obedience. They were obedient givers. Um, Paul is expressing his heartfelt gratitude for these people and celebrating them. And you really get a sense of family and love in his words. There's great affection that he's talking about. He even uses some of those really warm family words just to say, I'm praying for you. I'm thankful for you guys. And we've got to remember that Paul was writing uh, from an in, in prison. He was writing this in a place that was not particularly joyful himself, but there's such joy in his words. In verse 10, verse 9, sorry, it says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. These are already an incredibly loving group of believers that are gathered here in Philippi, but he's saying, I want you to have even more love. You know that strength that God has given you? I'm praying that he increases it. I think so often as Christians, we want to improve on our weaknesses, um, but sometimes God's wanting to pour out a greater measure in the areas of our strength, and that's what Paul's prayer is for them here. But in verse 10, it says, so that you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ. Pure on the inside, blameless on the outside, I want your love to grow so that you will approve what is excellent. I want you to have knowledge and discernment so that you will know what God wants. And that's going to make you pure on the inside and blameless on the outside. He goes on then to address some of their concerns. They're a bit worried that he's in prison. And the reason for that is obviously because you wouldn't want your friend to be in prison. But also because the last time when he was uh, first in this region, he was put into prison because uh, there was, a st- again, you can read this story in Acts, but there was um, some traders who were very unhappy with the word of God being spread in their region because they made money off superstitions and fortune telling and lots of things that were not godly. So they had these guys, Paul and Silas, thrown into prison and through a miraculous turn of events, God released them from that prison when they started praying and worshipping him. But now the Philippians are reading about Paul in prison again and wondering, why isn't God setting you free this time? Should we be worried? What's going wrong here? Are you in some way in trouble or what can we do to help you? But Paul explains that actually he is imprisoned for Christ. And we've talked about this before, but it says, you know, there's almost a uh, it's not his desire to be free. It's his desire to preach Christ. And so he's saying, I'm I'm exactly where I need to be. I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing in this situation. He talks about people's motives in the way that they preach Christ and explains to people that, listen, it doesn't matter if they're, um, you know, preaching out of selfish motivation, out of ambition. What matters is that Christ is preached. And it's just such a great reminder to us that sometimes we can over-examine our own mind and our own approach, but God just wants people to know. He just wants people to share the good news. And that's our job. So a beautiful introduction to this great uh, this great congregation and this great book of joy. In verse 27, it says, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that's, for me, one of the takeaways from this letter. I love it. And I'm looking forward to jumping into it with you about the joy of living with Christ. So tell me what God showed you.